Professor Joshua Landers, Director of the Center for the Middle East Studies at Oklahoma University. Welcome to Al Arabiya, sir. It's a pleasure being with you. On Wednesday of this week, the 24th of this month, marked the sixth month anniversary on the start of the war in the Ukraine. We all know the effect of this war on food uh, security in the world, but as a Middle East scholar and a professor, can you tell us how did this war affect international relation and diplomacy in the Middle East? Uh, for example, which Middle Eastern country gained most from this crisis diplomatically? I think, um, you know, it's a very interesting question. I think there's three major countries which have benefited from the Ukraine war. Turkey, Iran, and of course, Saudi Arabia. They are three of the major players in the Middle East, uh, powerful countries, and each of them have gained uh, increasing leverage. Of course, for the Middle Eastern people, it's been um, a real blow. How did uh, Turkey uh, exploit this crisis? How did it benefit? Uh... Well, Turkey is perhaps, you know, Turkey is one of the countries which has gained the most because it has tremendous leverage. It is, of course, geographically close to Ukraine. It's sitting uh, on the underside of the Black Sea. The Bosphorus Straits, Dardanelles, are the only way to get out of the Black Sea for grain to get out. And we have saw Turkey has just negotiated this grain deal, which is allowing Ukrainian grain to get out. Its drones have played a big factor in the Ukrainian war, Bayraktar. And um, it's a main conduit for Russian money, oil, and trade. But just recently, uh, Erdogan sat down with Putin and said they hope to have $100 billion worth of trade next year. America is desperately trying to get Turkey to cut off that trade and to follow sanctions. But so far, Russian banks have been opening and have been sending their money to Turkey. Russian yachts have been going and and uh, anchoring off Turkey. So Turkey is sitting in a very important position where it can trade, it can negotiate, and it can play both sides off the middle. Well, Iran, uh, of course, has been, I think, um, a beneficiary in, in some ways. It could, it has teetered both ways because, of course, for a while we thought perhaps the United States would not want to negotiate and take this Iran deal, the nuclear deal, seriously because it wants to punish Iran, which is an ally of Russia. On the other hand, oil. Iran is one country which could produce a lot more oil. It exports less than two million barrels a day, about a million and a half, and it could export very easily four, even six million, which it's done in the past. It's one of the great gas, of course, um, reserves of the world, and that could go to Europe. Uh, it could help with inflation. So in all those, for all those reasons, I think Washington wants to get an Iran deal uh, because it doesn't want to bomb Iran. Its focus is now on the war in Ukraine and, of course, an emerging China. To, to bomb Iran, which is what would have to happen if there is no Iran deal, I think is a little bit too much for America. And so this gives Iran leverage in its negotiations with the United States over a nuclear deal. You mean it's too much for the United States at this uh, particular juncture when there's a war in the Ukraine? Uh, it, can, you know, it, 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 it can't be everywhere all the time. And, and that means getting into a, a, a war with Iran would be devastating because if there were, if it bombed Iran, Iran would, could cut off the Straits of Hormuz. The United States would have to get deeply involved in a much bigger um, battlefield and arena. And it would allow Russia and China to, um, you know, to, to, to put pressure on the United States if, it, if this war bleeds out of the Ukrainian, just the Ukrainian battlefield. See, many economics, uh, economic experts say, still say that oil is king and fossil oil fuel is, king. is far from dead. Do you agree with this uh, statement? Absolutely. Look, at, 
<laughs> you know, Mr. Talal, the world is adding a billion people every 12 years. We're at almost 8 billion, and in 12, 13 years, we'll be at 9 billion. All those people want two cars, a big house, air conditioning. Global warming means more air conditioning. Um, it, it's, the, the world is getting richer. India, China, the middle class is exploding. That's a good story. But it means that all those people want cars, want big houses, and want more energy. And yes, we're, we're beginning to get smart about solar power and wind power and alternatives, but they're not really making a dent in the increasing demand for oil and gas. About 2 million barrels a year are added to the world consumption of uh, uh, 2 million barrels a day are added to world consumption every year. And we haven't seen that go down. It went down in COVID, but that was for COVID reasons. And now it's shot right back up again. And so the world is continuing to consume more and more fossil fuels, despite the growth of uh, alternative energy. Uh, the American latest bombing raid on Syria uh, last Wednesday, we noticed reports talking about Afghans and Syrian casualties but not Iranian casualties. Was that by design by the Americans not to affect the current negotiations? Um, you know, I think the Americans at first said that they had killed no one. I don't think the Americans were trying. They said they were trying to be proportional. And this came in response to Iranian-backed militias sending drones to attack the American base at Tanf which is blocking trade between Baghdad and Damascus. And, um, and so America is trying to be, it says it's trying to be proportional. I don't think it was trying to kill people. It was trying to do some damage and, and send a message to Syria and to Iran. Don't do this. Don't attack us. We'll hit you right back tenfold. Uh, it seems that they've killed a number of people. And, uh, and that's, that's caused Syria to attack back again. Uh, and just today, we got a back and forth with Syrians sending rockets towards an American base near Deir Zor, and America bombed the, the truck that sent out the rockets, got destroyed, and some people were wounded or killed uh, at that initiation site. So the, the tit for tat is going on. If Israel decided to bomb Iran nuclear facilities and the United States is reluctant to do that, does Israel have the has the capability uh, to 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 go it alone? You know, Israel has the capability to go it alone. They've asked for bunker buster bombs. They've asked for a lot of uh, you know heavyweight weaponry that could take out these Iranian sensors. And certainly, Israel has the capacity to put Iran back uh, quite a bit. The problem is that if Israel were to attack, Iran would certainly go after the Gulf. And it has promised that it would shut Straits of Hormuz. And it would, uh, and that's, of course, on the front line. And then what happens if they do that? Then the United States and the U.S. Navy have to come into play in order to open up the Straits and to keep the oil flowing to the world because oil prices would spike through the roof inflation would go crazy, and uh, it would be a great pressure on the rest of the world. So the United States would get sucked into this one way or the other. And that's why U.S. and the and Israel have been coordinating closely. The United States has been keeping Israel informed of the negotiations. On the other hand, Israel has said, we don't like it, and we're going to do whatever we feel is in our own personal interests, our own national interests, and if we have to bomb, we'll do it. Now, some Israeli policy leaders are saying the Iran deal is actually good. It's, it's, it's not a good deal, but it's the best we can do. It's better than the alternative of war. Others are saying it's a disaster for Israel. And, um, and if it, it'll let, let Iran get out of sanctions and Iran will get richer and it'll become more powerful. So, I mean, it's, it's a hard, it's unclear which way this will cut. Uh, time has caught up with us. Uh, thank you so, so much. I just wanted to add that maybe some country has benefited to some extent 
but this war has been disastrous to the people of the region and to the world. Uh, food security is uh, is in danger. Um, people are high facing high prices at the at the pumps at the uh, grocery shops. It has been a, a terrible war. But I thank you for your thoughts uh, and for your input and and for your insight. As always, thank you so, so much, Professor. Well, it's been a pleasure. And Mr. Talal, uh, your questions are always uh, challenging and insightful. Thank you for having me on.